put research in air quotes because I'm, I'm your speaker now and, and, and taking director position, I don't do a damn bit of research. Um, but what I wanted to do, I wanted to take the opportunity to, to show you um, what I present on a regular basis uh, as an outreach PowerPoint. So if you've heard a lot about harmful algal blooms and new transloading and the problems with Lake Erie, and so what, I, what I'm going to show you is the presentation that I give when we're invited as a program of Sea Grant and Stone Lab to go to farmers legislators or science writers, rotary clubs, so really trying to take this complex, really complex issue and try and get it into the hands of people that aren't trained scientists. Um, so I'm going to give you just kind of a, a harmful algal bloom talk, why Lake Erie has these issues and that sort of thing. And then following me, um, you know, I don't think I'll take a whole hour on this, uh, so following that, uh, Dr. Rick Stone from NOAA will come up and talk to you a little bit more about detailed science and what NOAA is doing to uh, do forecasts. I will subject myself to the same pain that I subject others to by telling you how I got from um, being grounded every week of my life as a eighth grader to now. Um, so I can walk you down that road. And I think everybody that's, that we've asked to speak at these events kind of has the same story. Many of us, it's not a straight line, it's a pretty um, diverse route. And so for me, uh, I just always like being outside, camping outdoors. So I went to Ohio University to take environmental science. Um, started taking some of those courses, and um, it's not until my junior year, um, actually until my sophomore junior year, I, I got an internship with the Ohio EPA, shopping fish on all the Great Lakes tributaries in the lake. <clears throat> and so um, it literally changed my life. I mean, I definitely thought I wanted to, you know, work for you know, TNC or do some environmental consulting, but when I got into that internship, I then just changed my direction to think about the state agency. I really wanted to do electroshocking. <clears throat> so I spent my time doing that, and then, of course, when you finish your undergrad degree, you're ready to go get that first job, and you start applying for that job that you now know you want, but they want you to have a master's degree. Um, so I took a year off of school. I wasn't ready to go right back into it again. I went out to Montana and spent a year out there doing some conservation work uh, for that more than 10 months that I was out there. I think I spent seven of it living in a tent in the back of Montana. So that was something that kind of changed. Uh, my perspective um, for that too. So then I came back and I applied for graduate schools and I, and I got into a master's program in, in fisheries stuff um, at Bowling Green State University. And for that, and, and maybe many of you don't know this, when you go into grad school, you guys are thinking about more student loans and more debt. Oftentimes, not absolutely the case, but oftentimes your graduate degree will be paid for because you'll be doing things like being a TA for some courses. And so because I was a master's student working on that degree, so I could get that DPA job. I started TA and fall in love with teaching. And so then I'm like, oh crap, now I gotta think this all over again. And so basically I finished my master's and now I knew I wanted to teach at the college level, so now I needed a PhD. And so I started down that route doing the PhD stuff, and my research was up here. So from 2004, 2004, 2005, I'm doing a lot of what Chelsea's doing. I lived up here for four months out of the year um, doing my work. And so with my um, Mesocosms, I was going to work on round goby smallmouth bass interactions um, right down where the fire pit is, and that's where I was doing all my research. And the same thing we do in Chelsea, and when farmers come up here or state legislators come up here, Jeff Royer, the director at that time, would come up and say, Chris, tell me what you're doing. And I quickly learned that as a scientist, I had to stop using acronyms and big words and actually try and communicate complex issues to the general public. Oh, crap, I fell in love with that now. And so I had to figure out how to work that in my career. I did finish my PhD and got a job out at Pennsylvania University called Kutztown University, and I taught out there for two years. Uh, but the assistant director here at Sea Grant had left, and Jeff Royer contacted me and said, "Would you think about this application?" And so I started working there. But everything was like a different experience changed the trajectory, and so it was a very um, odd route to get to to where I'm to where I'm at today. I think. So let's pull this down, and again, I, I think with that introduction of how I the return button here. Good. Um, so what I want to show you here, and then slideshow is this triangle here. Perfect. All right. Is kind of how I've now learned that you've got to take these complex science topics that you get information from master students, PhD students, professors, and you got to distill that in a way that you can get it to an audience that really isn't trained the way you are. So this is typically what I give right now: it's lake algae, nutrient loading, and current research efforts. Um, so this is kind of the direction we're going to go for this talk. I give this talk all the time, so if, if you want to stop 
me in the middle and ask questions while I'm rolling through, um, feel free to do that too. For some reason, it's not advancing with. Oh, because it's not. It's my own computer. I should have to have my own clicker. <clears throat> so, what I'm going to show you on this first slide is really this idea of why should we care about Lake Erie. So, many of you guys have seen. Oh, the animation's not going to work on here anymore. That happened all day. Yeah, it did. <coughs> So, where's the one that says share screen? Do you know? Oh, here. Share screen. And I'm going to go here. <laughs> Look at that. Always more than one way to skin a cat here. Um, so, come on, come on. There. So, this is how I start off. I always talk about how we, why do we care about uh, Lake Erie? You know, why do we care about the tribal algorithm? And this slide is related to tourism. What it's showing you is the eight counties in, in Ohio, uh, I'm sorry, the 88 counties in Ohio. The ones that are surrounded in red are the eight that border Lake Erie. The numbers you're seeing on the left-hand side here illustrate this is older data. You saw newer data presented by Melinda Huntley um, today if you were in some of those tab stocks. But for, this is in 2015 data, the sales of tourism related to tourism in those eight counties related to about $12.9 billion. Put that in perspective, the entire state's tourism revenue is right around $40 billion. So 30% of the entire state's revenue comes from 8 out of 88 counties. Okay, you're seeing numbers in here of people that work in the tourism sector make about $3.3 billion in wages. It generates $1.7 million in taxes. This is local, state, and federal taxes. And then it employs about 120,000 people. Now, the reason why we should care about that number because 120,000 people across these eight counties results in about one in a Clearly, it shows that having a healthy Lake Erie support for tourism. But I can't stop there. There are other reasons, there are clearly other reasons to help protect this lake. This text box isn't meant to be an exhaustive list. But you can see that there is a cost to removing the toxins associated with these blooms that are in the lake. So these water treatment plants are dumping money into the treatment of those, uh, those waters. Also, we've seen the cost associated when communities have advisories, not necessarily bans, but advisories. If you went back to Toledo in 2014, the amount of revenue lost from hotels and businesses that they couldn't use the water. The other one is we have a vibrant charter captain industry. About 40% of the entire Great Lakes charter captain industry is based in Lake Erie. Um, marinas are important because when you have these blooms, the businesses, the marinas can generate the good juice. And then finally, the last thing, and many of you probably heard about this in, in the recent talks that you've heard on the island, but agriculture is tremendously important. So we need to also know that as we address this harmful algal bloom issue and we go and address the nutrient input from ag, we need to find a win-win. We need to find a situation where we keep that ag industry vibrant but also address the food. Then I go on and talk about the major groups of algae. Again, you've got to know your audience here. They're not going to know what a, a, a cyanobacteria is or harmful algal bloom. So I just lay this out in very simple terms. All of you that have been taking these sorts of courses know it's much more complicated than that. But basically, for the most part, your diatoms dominate in the winter and, and in the spring. Okay, they're still around at the other seasons, but that's when they dominate. Not a single species that's in Lake Erie that is a diatom produces toxins. This group or a kind of organism will give way to green algae. Of course, we know that these will dominate in the late spring into parts of the summer, but not a single species of green produces a toxin. Not until you get into this uh, mid to late summer into the, into the fall that you get blue-green algae. Okay? I often use this as part to educate. As a, as a person that's trying to educate the general public, when you say harmful algal bloom, that algal bloom is pretty generic. And it's gotten to the point now where people see if the, if the water's green, they think it's toxic. And so it'd be nice to be able to go back in time and say these are harmful cyanobacteria blooms. And so I try and make that connection to the audience. So, um, setting the stage for why Lake Erie. So why is all the attention in Lake Erie? We do see blooms in Cyan uh, Saginaw Bay. And we Green Bay, but why is Lake Erie getting all the attention? Why does it appear to be this kind of canary in the coal mine for the Great Lakes? And so what I show is this first image here, and you see the depth profiles of the five Great Lakes, with Lake Erie clearly the shallowest of the, of the five. So it's important to know that because you're going to have the type of ability for mixing of sediments, the so resuspension of sediments, but you're also going to have high light levels throughout that, that water. The next thing I show is land use. So this figure 
um, drive back home. Percent land use is on that vertical axis, the y axis, and then the vibrate lace around the axis. I can put a box around Erie to draw your attention there. Okay, but what you'll see is within Lake Erie, what is that land being used for? And we go from residential crop, pasture, forest, all the way. And so we see that Lake Erie is clearly first and residential. So we have the most amount of people living in the watershed related to here. We are first in ag land, as far as the number of acres that are in ag production. We are second only to Ontario in pasture land. You can see that here, so Ontario here to the right. With so much use in these other three sectors, of course, we have the least amount of forest of all five Great Lakes watersheds. And as far as wetlands, the red color, we're right in the middle, right? So you can see Michigan and, um, and Huron have more wetlands than, than Erie. But I put the number 10% in here because it reminds me to tell people that we have an estimated 10% of historic wetlands left in the Lake Erie watershed. And we know that these are critical habitat for kind of stopping some of that nutrient flow in the future. So with this, this land use, you can see that we're going to get more sediment, more nutrients than all the other Great Lakes. And also we have a shallow system with high light. And so what this says is that you're going to have a high probability of these. We also got to put this into context of climate change. Right. These are Maumee River statistics. This is coming from Laura Johnson and Pete Richard from Heidelberg. But basically, the time frame 1960 to roughly present day, you know, 2010, we are seeing statistically significant increases in the number of storm events per year, okay, up 67%. Spring events, which we know from some of the discussions you guys have seen and heard over the last couple of days, we're talking about that one March through the end of July, because we know that input through our model, some of the stuff that Rick talks about, will drive those balloons that we see starting now. Um, and then also annual storm discharge is up 53%. So not only are we seeing more frequent storms, but we're seeing evidence of larger storms when they do happen. More frequent two-inch rainfalls or three inch rainfalls. And the last two or three weeks have been evidence of that. I always pause when I get to this point because this is a good reminder for me to tell the audience is that you're going to hear in the media things like phosphorus, phosphorus, phosphorus. Some are starting to catch the fact that nitrogen is also a contributor to these blooms. But what doesn't get discussed is this kind of information which is that we see that 80 to 90% of the loading, so those nutrients moving into the system, are coming in 10 to 20% of the time, in short windows of time. So not only is it truly a, a nutrient management issue, but we need to know that it's also a water management issue. So as we address how much nutrients we're putting on our fields and how much phosphorus is in our soils, we've got to be working on ways to disconnect hydrologic pathways and hold that water on the landscape a little bit longer so that we can um, help address it. At this point, I've given a lot of data slides, so I usually turn to eye candy to get people entertained a little bit here. Mm -hmm. uh, candy. Candy. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> My <cousin. laughs> uh, So this is the bloom that happened near our lab just by the docks 2010. This is the previous director's hand, Jeff, Jeff Reuter. What you can see is when you get these surface scums, because there's no wind and wave action, these can get pretty thick. And depending on the, the, the genetics of these populations, these can be pretty high toxicity. But what I try to drive home here is that his you know, fingers are only in there a half inch inch and, and you lose sight of it. What you'll also see when he plucks water off of that balloon, you'll see clear water beneath. So it illustrates that idea of surface. Uh, Canada Goose, um, near our docks again, this is 2011 now, the second worst bloom on record. So you can see him swimming through that, you know, what looks like spilled paint or pea green soup. Uh, a colleague of ours, all of us around the room, interact with uh, Dr. Richard Krauss quite a bit. He's with the USGS based out of Sandusky, I believe. This is him, his family, and friends out by Marblehead, which is right near the military dock. But, you know, there are times of year when you'll see this. We interact with the charter captains quite regularly. You'll talk to them when they'll actually feel their boat bog down when going through these long storms. They can get pretty thick and busy. Just a Western Basin problem. This is an image from 2013. You'll see here's Peely Island, here's our Bass Island. So this is what's considered the Western Basin. Half of that basin is covered in this specific image. But this is 2011, again, the second worst bloom on record. This is just with the Lake Erie problem now. Here's Cleveland for your frame of reference. There's Toledo, Detroit, Lake St. Clair. So this is now scooting out east of Cleveland towards New York and Pennsylvania. And based on the winds for this current picture, it's up along the Canadian shoreline. So again, now just Lake Erie. No, if you went to a web browser and typed in Habs in Ohio, this sort of thing will come up. You know, you're seeing many of our state parks. Here's the Ohio River, which in 2015 had a contiguous bloom from basically northeast Ohio all the way down to Cincinnati. Not a bloom that started one place and kind of cruised down, but the entire stretch of the Ohio River. 
probably heard a lot about Grand Lake St. Mary. You never want to see, you know, McDonald's shamrock shake rolling up on the beach. <laughs> Typically not a good sign of ideal conditions. Okay, Buckeye Lake, uh, this is a lake if you're not familiar with Ohio, it's just kind of east of, east, a little northeast of Columbus. It has a history of some pretty severe storms. Okay, so let's get into some solutions or, or what we're doing to try and address this problem. The one we have here, and I'll show you the backdrop uh, of this text box, the image behind it in a second. But basically what's happened is we've had a bunch of Research both from the Canadian and U.S. side to come together through the Great Lakes, <laughs> through the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, and basically decide what is that percent reduction that we want to see in phosphorus so that we can see a change in these blooms. And so the scientists can kind of, kind of coalesce around this number of a 40 percent reduction. Um, I recommend you read this recent version of Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. You saw speakers come up from the IJC; they recommended a good read on it. Um, annex Four is one of the ten annexes that you have now heard about multiple times in here. That's the nutrient. So this was uh, the, basically Ontario, um, Ohio, and Michigan signed on to this value being the number that we want to hit, this 40% reduction. But as oftentimes we know, signing on and saying that number looks good is very different from putting actions in place. You know, some of you can think back to maybe I'm dating myself with the Kyoto Protocol where all these countries sign to do climate change stuff and the signature doesn't really mean actions in place. So what is currently going on under the backdrop of this States are developing their own what we call domestic action plan. So they're trying to sit, and for us at the Ohio EPA that's doing this, and sit and figure out, okay, 40% of what we need to do, well, what kind of specific actions can we start putting in place or even to the point of requiring to get to that? All of these states in Ontario will pull together drafts of this, and what's supposed to pop out of this in the, in the near future is a regional domestic action plan. So let's pull these text box away, though, real quick and talk about this image. So these are the five Great Lakes. This is related to total phosphorus in metric tons in 2008. Wherever you see a green bar, that's a connecting channel between the Great Lakes. Wherever you see a purple or pinkish, I'm not very good on my colors, it's too much white dress for me every morning. Um, if it's a dot, it means less than 100 metric tons input from that tributary. If it's a bar, it represents greater than 100 metric tons. What should probably draw your attention is some of these places where we know there's bloom. So here's Green Bay. Um, so that's the trip for Green Bay. Here's Saginaw Bay. And then you're seeing Maumee at 3,812. If you can't read it from your seat, on the Sandusky River at 1,105. So these are pretty large values. Just like the shamrock shapes, not a good thing to see. You never want to see the graph with a cracked bar at the top because it doesn't fit on the right scale. Okay? And so what happens when we show this information and people hear about this? Instantly they say, yeah, the, the Maumee needs to be addressed. It's the largest tributary of all the tributaries in the Great Lakes. Sandusky is an issue. But I often hear people blaming Detroit. They see that green connecting bar, and they say, yeah, okay, we'll work in our watershed to address this, but look at what we're getting. We need to go up to Wisconsin's and the Minnesotas and the Michigans and figure out what's going on. So I use this as an opportunity to kind of dispel some of those uh, discussions. And the way I want to do that is by going to this. And this is three different years, and it's, again, total phosphorus in metric tons annually. This is 2011, 2012, 2013. Very wet year, fairly dry year, and then as you've seen, this is uh, right now, currently, this is the third year for bloom, Rick. I think this is the third largest bloom of 13. Yeah. Good. So it tells you what's coming down from the, the Detroit River, so total phosphorus. You know, varies from year to year, but pretty consistent. Same thing for the Maumee River. And then these are all the other trips. Okay. So let's sum this up and get this in. So a scientist, you're all going to be blamed or hear this in the future. The scientists can make stats to everything they want to say. We know that's not true, right? The data in, the stats are stats. There's a program. You're going to get a value out of it. What scientists can be accused of doing is presenting the data in a misleading way. This is part of that. And Laura Johnson spoke a little bit about this, and so did Rick. This is just total phosphorus. We need to think of this in relation to water flow. Right? We don't want to know how much phosphorus is total. We want to know what the concentration is, what's available for those organisms to grow at the time they're able to grow. And so if we look at this same range, the average across these three years, this is flow into Lake Erie. We get 95% of our water from the Detroit River and only 4% from the Maumee. What we're talking about if we're doing concentration, you need to think about dissolving this phosphorus and this amount of water versus this phosphorus and that amount. Right? So it's like taking, as Laura Johnson uses this, it's like taking a packet of sugar and dissolving in a pot of coffee versus a packet of sugar in a cup of coffee. Okay? And so what we know through all the science that came out of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement and other um, research
research groups that we want a flow weighted mean concentration of 0.23 milligrams of total phosphorus. So if you actually make this calculation where you're dissolving this phosphorus in this flow, the Detroit River is at 0 0.014, right? Where the Maumee is nearly twice that. What it tells you is if we had this ability to put a dam across the Detroit River and stop the flow of water, you're not going to change the alcohol situation. What's that? Make it worse because what, what do you do if you also slow the flow of the Detroit River? You're not, because all that water's coming in, you're not diluting what's coming from the Maumee. So then you've even got a more serious problem. Good. You've seen this probably today. I borrow this and give credit where credit is due. But basically, this shows you what observed blooms we had on our severity index over here uh, on a scale of 0 to 10 and a, 10 and a half. The tan bars are what were actually observed. And if we were able to put that 40% reduction in place, the green bars represent what would have occurred in that. You'll see the target line that we like to see for the, what's called out of the Annex 4, again, the 40% reduction. And what it tells you is we don't get rid of blooms entirely. But what it does is show us that two years out of 15, you have a violation. And the rest would be considered what we would call manageable. Okay? Um, what I want to spend the next couple of minutes talking about is some of the research efforts that are actually in this space. But hopefully now you can see the, the story that we're trying to paint and the picture we're trying to paint here and, and where the issues are. So what's going on right now, um, 55 ads related projects. They're being funded under four sources of funds. Um, as soon as the Toledo water crisis happened in 2014, um, the vice president um, and dean for the College of Food, Ag, and Environmental Sciences at OSU went into his operating budget and found a million dollars to put forward to fund five projects. Okay? I will briefly talk about three of those projects real quickly for us. But the beauty about what happened when this money was put into place, we called it F2F, which is field to faucet. So what happens, what research can we do between what's going on in the field versus treatment plants to get us to drink water. Um, what was great about this, not only do we mobilize money for five projects, but the dean um, and vice president of that college, he's now the provost of the university, walked down to the state capitol and said, what is the state able to do? This is what OSU is going to do. And what we were able to get is $2 million worth of funding from the Ohio Department of Higher Education. Um, so we sat down, we actually went to Heidelberg University, we had about 70 scientists sitting in a room, and we all together thought about, okay, what are the burning questions that we need to know answers to now? And we figured out how to divide $2 million across the project. Uh, Two-year projects, about Six months, eight months into that process, we went back to the higher department of higher to the Ohio Department of Higher Education and asked for more funds. They liked the effort that was ongoing, some of the progress that we're making, but they put another two million into that. As you guys have learned from being here at Stone Lab, and, and I tried to talk about it multiple times, is that C grant is a NOAA funded entity, and we actually get money from NOAA to fund research. And so we put money into the game too. Um, two different rounds of nine grant funded projects to, for a total of $1.8 million. So you've got a total of, if you do the math, um, 55, 56 projects, because some are, are paid out of two sources. And then if you add up the dollar amount, we're right around $6.8 million, $6 million in this class. So I just want to hit on a couple of these. I don't want to vlog it down too much, but if afterwards you, you see me around the island and you want to talk about some more specific projects, I'd be happy to show you. There is a report that just came out on this on Tuesday where you can read about all 32 of these. Department-funded projects, which is pretty, uh, pretty elaborate. Let's talk about a couple of these. So again, these are the five um, images that, that have been created by OSU Communications to talk about this F2F project. The one I want to talk about is this manure recycling project. We actually have technology now that exists where a semi-truck with a series of centrifuges on it and lime additions, so chemical additions along that process, can take manure, okay, pump it through that system, which is a large volume of waste, a lot of Animal operations don't know how to dispose of all that manure because it's got high phosphorus and they're, they're being told not to apply to their field. When you run that manure through this semi truck, the water coming out of the back end, the large volume associated with that waste, has about one milligram per liter of phosphorus. For those of you that are not familiar with those terms, that's a volume or a, a concentration that's safe to apply on the field in, in flow. And what can be reserved are what, what are being called lime cakes or phosphorus cakes that are solids that are then easier to transport out of that. Another one that's a great project under here is a microcystin detector. So when you go to the water treatment plants right now, so those plants that are pulling water and cleaning it up so that people can consume it, the test that is being asked to be used by Ohio EPA is what's called an ELISA test. Those tests take anywhere from you know, four to six hours to see what the results are. By that time, that water has already come into the plant and it's moving its way through that system. This research 
this right now allows you to get detection within five minutes. Okay, so it's pretty cool how it works. I was just going to, you guys are familiar like, with like electrophoresis machines, right? So you run a charge through the, through the gel. What this researcher has done is created that gel, but placed antibodies infused on that gel. Those antibodies bind to microcystin. So what they do is measure the current from one side of that gel to the other in clear conditions. And then they add toxin water on top of it. And as that toxin binds to those antibodies, it slows the electrical current across the auger. And so they can measure that concentration related to the change in the electrical current. Um, it's being developed right now for marketing. They're saying that anywhere from $2,000 to $3,000 for the machine to do the electrical charge. And the auger chips that mass produce can be anywhere between two to three bucks per chip. So it seems like something that we can get into the hands of a lot of people to know what the toxins look like right now. And this is huge. Because right now, if you don't have the ability to figure out how much toxins are in your, um, your plant because of the ELISA test, you are basically looking for the presence of that algae or the cyanobacteria. You have to assume it's producing toxins, and you have to assume it's producing at a high level. And so you have to treat accordingly. Now we could know, oh, hey, the organism's here, but the toxin's not here yet. Or the organism is here, and the toxin's here, but it's at a low concentration. So it allows these places to actually adjust their treatments to address the problem. The last one in this page before I go on to talk about some of these other ones is uh, bloom detection. This is a multifaceted project, but one of them that I think is really important for us to talk about is we now have the ability to actually fingerprint botulism. What I mean by that is we actually have research from Dr. Paul Mauser um, at Ohio State University again. He's looking at the molecular weight of the, of, of the structure that has the botulism. And so what we're seeing is that Excuse me, there's an actual signature associated with the phosphorus that comes from hogs versus pigs versus chickens versus human waste coming from a wastewater treatment plant versus the phosphorus being applied to our animal waste. So not only are you going out and measuring the phosphorus concentration, but there is indication in this early evidence uh, from this project that you can actually look at the molecular weight of that phosphorus from that sample and determine where it is. It allows you to go back up the watershed and say, hey, hey, we've got phosphorus here, but not only that, 80% of it looks like it has a signature. Moving on, um, sorry. Uh, moving on. Just wanted to make sure that, that you guys are aware too that we're seeing a lot of movement in Ohio specifically with collaboration across universities. So you're seeing a lot of different universities interact on some of these ODAG projects. Um, this isn't an exhaustive list; it gets pretty crowded on the slide. Um, but there's a lot of different state agencies on here, um, farm bureaus, uh, federal agencies, and USDA and USGS. So it's been a very collaborative uh, process. Under the Ohio Department of Higher Education grant, we went about this a little bit um, different. The OSU project, basically, all the scientists at OSU got together and thought about where are our skill sets, you know, what can we do best to solve the problem. And this, we came into the process with five focus areas, or five priority areas. Um, so what you're seeing here is that we have um, these categories of where the projects have been put. The first one we, we call Bloom's Source and Movement. All the research projects funded with it here are trying to figure out where does the bloom show up, when it's there, where does it move? What causes it to be toxic versus non-toxic? How does it mix vertically in the water? Okay, multiple projects in that space. The other one is produce safe drinking water. This is the one when you see that Annex 4 40% reduction, we're saying we want that 40% reduction by 2025. We don't have the luxury of waiting to get phosphorus down by 2025 to see if we can drink the water. So a lot of these projects are going into things like how do we add charcoal at the right rate can we produce biofilters that will actually remove the toxin? Can we use ozone? Can we use UV light? If we do use those, at what concentration and how do they interact with chlorine? So a lot of those projects are actually working on the efficiency and the capability of removing toxins with the The next one is protect public health. This one is in that space where we really don't know much about how the toxin reacts in the body. We know some general things about liver toxin and nervous toxin and skin lesions and like that. But we really don't know, are we more concerned about small dose exposure over a long period of time, or is it one large exposure of one period of time? Is it a carcinogen? How do we even know if you've been exposed? So if you come in and you're showing symptoms of microcystin poisoning, if we drew blood or took a urine sample, we don't even know what we're looking for. Because as soon as that toxin is ingested, it gets metabolized into a different form. So this research is starting to look at cancer stuff and how do we detect the toxin within the body acid. And the last step that has a lot of projects within it too is this education and engage section. And 
and what we're doing here is really trying to um, get the word out of cool science that we know right now. So what BMPs work best under which conditions? How do we get that information into the hands of farmers? Working with farmers to figure out how do we make a change in behavior. These are some of the universities that are funded underneath um, the Ohio Department of Hydro Higher Education. So again, a, a great collaboration across universities. Um, good. So as I often like to say in, in talks like this when I'm speaking with the general public, we don't know all the answers. There's a lot of unknowns on a lot of the RE projects right now. We're working on things that we don't know about how the nutrients behave and, and, and all that sort of stuff. And so what I like to say is that we are right now directionally quoting a, a, a USDA employee, uh, Lieutenant King, we know enough that we can make recommendations on things that we need to be doing. And so what I'm going to go through is a list of things that we clearly know from current data that will help correct this problem. This one is what agricultural can do, because specifically in the Maumee River Basin, the vast majority of the acres there is in agricultural production. So we have a lot of solutions to help with that kind of sector of the, the state. First one is a Senate bill for us. It was actually passed already, Senate Bill 1, and it basically and the application, the winter, sorry, the fall and winter application was fertilized. Okay? This happens because what we know is if you apply during these periods when the ground's frozen, as soon as that ground thaws, those nutrients that are sitting in the surface. As a scientist, though, and as we farmers to do anything they can to disconnect hydrologic pathways. So 
maybe moving from drain tiles into wetlands. So instead of just dumping it directly into the stream, can we run it through a constructed wetland? Can we do things like flying inlets, where you're basically taking a straight pipe from the field to the ditch and running it through wood chips or gravel beds? So it slows it down and gets the nutrients to absorb. There's even people that are working on ways to treat that water as it leaves um, absorbent material and, and basically stock that you shove in the tiles so as the tile water is coming through, some of that phosphorus is absorbed into the tile. So there's a lot of you know, innovative space here. And the last one, we got to think about manure. Um, phosphorus is phosphorus is phosphorus. So the algae don't care whether it's a commercial fertilizer or whether it's manure. You've seen instances where a farmer will go out and actually have a company come in and tell him, based on your soil samples, you need this much fertilizer. So they add the phosphorus, and then they think, well, I need nitrogen, so I'll put manure on for my nitrogen. So that manure has phosphorus too. Right? So we need to be thinking about what manure does to our I don't ever want to leave just making these farmers feel like it's all their part. Nice work. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Man, it's so close. I thought that's how I'm getting I already embarrassed myself once. I'll talk. I, I was in class when I was at Columbia State University, and I tried to draw a, a rain shadow, right, where you have a cloud on one side of the mountain range and full moisture, and it goes up the top and drops some moisture on the other side. I had this mountain with two clouds on either side, and a student raised his hand and said, you realize you just drew a penis on the board? <laughs> There's like 200 students in the lab, and I turned beet red. It was absolutely horrible. It was one of the worst lecture days of my life. So now Spartan's up there, too. Um, so what I try and do on this is now make sure that the farmers know that when we're trying to hit 40%, um, that it's not all on their shoulders, that this is a watershed effort. So I put things up there. Oh, I'll skip that down real quick. I put things up there that show there are other levers we can, we can turn. Tornado. Sounds like tornado. We're getting fucking battery. Look at that. That was too many inappropriate joke alarm went off. So one of the things that we can do in our suburban and urban areas is look about lawn care, right? So we can apply fertilizers to our lawns, but we need to make sure that the phosphorus is free. Scott's fertilizer company led the charge on this, but now if you go in any of your plastic box stores, Menards, Home Depot, Lowe's. Grab a fertilizer bag off the shelf. Most of them don't have phosphorus anymore. That's a good sign. Uh, reduce property runoff. So we can be doing things like rain barrels, terrace, forest services. So let's keep that water on our urban and suburban areas longer. Um, sewage treatment plants. We have sewage treatment plants that still have CSOs. What does that stand for? Good. Combined sewer overflows, right? When the water from our houses is joining up the water from the street, all going to the water treatment plant. Usually those water treatment plants can handle that unless you have a large storm. And then they're, over, uh, they're overridden with all this water. We're seeing projects going on if you're from the Cleveland area, $3 billion construction of tubes underneath the city. So when the water is too much for the water treatment plant to handle, they pump it into these underground tanks, treat the water they can, and when they catch up, then they pump it out of those tanks back into the water treatment plant. Okay? So we need to expedite the elimination of some of those CSOs. You can also help the sewage treatment plants out by reducing the volume you send. So do low flow shower heads or low flow toilets. And I did this. I went to my father and I said, hey, Dad, we got to you know, be part of the solution. Let's put in low flow toilets. Because I spent $150 on this toilet. It needs to flush in five minutes. So I convinced them that, well, it's this tank on the back of your toilet. When you flush that handle, it's all the water in that tank that goes through the toilet. So I told them to put bricks in the back of the toilet because that displaces the water so every flush is less. But my mom finds out that she's got bricks in the back of the toilet, so she went out to buy marbles to replace the bricks with marbles because she didn't want to burn the <laughs> That's the family I come from. Mom didn't want her baths or her toilets to look like you know, crap, so she put uh, the marbles in there. So that's where I come from. That's what I'm raised by. Uh, but so those are solutions we can do. Water treatment recommendations. We intentionally add orthophosphate phosphate, to water that is treated because it slows pipes from the road. I'm not advocating here to stop that because what city had a problem with this very issue? Right? Okay? So we need to stop those corrosion pipes. So we need some additive or we need to get to a place where we can replace some of that lead pipe. And last but not least, uh, septic tanks. We do have some septic tanks. The way they're normally supposed to run right through your backyard, they have a leach bed where that leach bed is supposed to take care of all those nutrients. Some of these things are actually draining into receiving water. So there are estimates that I've seen of upwards to a quarter or 30% of the septic tanks in Ohio are not functioning properly. So that's kind of where I leave this, and then I kind of tailor it off in the fact that first, our immediate needs are we don't have till 2025 to 
rely on safe drinking water. So we need to arm those treatment plants with tools, technologies, and the training to treat those toxins. And then in the background while that's happening, or while this is happening, we need to reduce that phosphorus by 40%. This can be through water management, and it can also be through soil testing. So let's get those soil phosphorus levels at that tri state for electrolyte conversion. Um, this is my last slide before the question slide. We often get the question of, what, so what's, why now? You know, why haven't had these blooms into the last decade and a half? This is a paper called Smith et al. This is just a subset of it. But all of these are likely contributing in some way, shape, or form. Um, some of them are going to be contributing more than others, but this, the answer to the problem we're in right now is not a simple one. We see things like this, right? We know that the equipment size that's on farmers' fields right now is increasing by pounds and pounds and pounds per year. So what happens is now they know they're compacting their soil. So I don't want to compact my soil, so why don't I put three years of phosphorus out in one pack? Right? Well, if you get a heavy rain on that one year, you put three years of rid of phosphorus on it. We are seeing some evidence that if you change the pH of the soil, it changes its ability to hold on to phosphorus. So some are saying is we're actually increasing the pH of our rain, so making it less acidic, so we're actually making soils more leaky to phosphorus. There's early evidence out that things like glyphosate. This is that Roundup Ready where you put it on your, uh, your, your crops. It doesn't kill your crops, but it kills the weed. There is some evidence that it's changing the chemistry of the soils so that the soils are more leaky to phosphorus. Is one of these driving the entire leakiness of the soils? Not likely, but all of these are probably playing. Okay. Now I'll go here and I'll just leave it with some questions. I'll field some of those and then we can either take a break or go right into the doctor here. Yeah, Dr. Yeah, so if we're going in and putting all these scrubbers in our coal-fired power plants, we're actually lowering the NOx and the SOx and the acidity of the rainfall. So when it falls, the soils are actually becoming slightly more basic. And there's evidence that basic soils are leaking. Yeah. 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 Great question. And so we've had some great surveys come out from OSU again specifically of a woman named Robin Wilson, Dr. Robin Wilson. And she's really looking at the attitudes of farmers and trying to figure out is there a certain type of farmer that is more willing to do changes versus those that are not paying attention. And it's pretty interesting to see those. But really what we're saying, and I'm going to screw the numbers up, but I know you guys are closer to them, it's about 18, 20 percent that are already doing it. Like they're the early adopters. The same other side of that. Telling them soil testing, right? But when we say that, they're going to be like, no, cost too much. Well, we got a problem with this. You were right. This happens and this happens. So a lot of it is this and these guys here, all of the scientists, being out there, and the grad students are doing it now too, being out there and being that non sensationalized scientific testing. And so that's what it is. When we go in here, every time I'm up here, I try and say those things like, I know when Senegal came in. Can't be an us versus them thing, and that we have to frankly take the money we're getting to find solutions. Whether it's this BMP works in this scenario, but it doesn't work in this scenario. When we find that, putting it in a published manuscript and presenting it at a conference is what science geeks are doing. You have to be willing to get out of your science laboratory and have that as a basis. And that's why I say, with my path to get to where I was, I never thought of that. I just wanted to be that professor until I was on this island, having to talk to legislators and farmers about my. I didn't realize how important it is for scientists to be able to communicate with the public. There's a book out there, it's, uh, I think it's, I'm going to push the title, Down from Your Ivory Tower, I think is this, somewhere along that line. It talks about, as a scientist, how we need to think about how we put things together. Right? We all love our big terms, we all love our acronyms, but if you're going to do that, you're, they're going to shut down right away. So you've got to figure out how to Some of those are in place right now. Like if you want to put a bumper strip in, so if you're farming right up to the river, you can get paid not to grow crops there. So they estimate how much revenue you get, you get a percentage. 
incentives that are out there, money-based programs to give people farmers to do those sorts of things, but we just need to think more critically about where those things are located. All right. Cool. Well, we got 10 minutes. Why don't we take a break till uh, 8 o'clock, and then we'll bring Dr. Rick get started here. Uh, we're happy to have Dr. Rick Stump from NOAA with us. Um, Gabe, this is your third talk of the day, is it not? Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, so he gave the hatch press briefing at uh, 9.30 in the morning, and then at 2 to 4, he was part of the webinar. And now he agreed to give you guys a talk. You can see Kenley here help us modify the bacteria for the rest of the week. Why is that correct? Now, I'm supposed to say something about how I got here. Tell him, yeah. <laughs> how long you spent in jail, when they let you out, is it good behavior or not good behavior, that whole thing would be great. Well, a couple of people at dinner actually heard part of this. Uh, the reason I'm here is I could type. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> yeah, I'm dating myself. You know, there, there's actually a course called typing back when I was in high school, and I took typing. I had a choice between computer science and typing, and I made the smart move. I took typing. Um, I actually do a lot of computer programming, but um, and so I got a summer job with um, USAID, State Department, in their science office because I was a science major and I could type. And the typing part was actually pretty cool because I would be doing cables to embassies. You've heard of WikiLeaks and all of that stuff? Well, I had a secret clearance. And I, I actually started reading the newspaper because I wanted to see in the post, I noticed that things that were classified as confidential would appear in about page eight of the front section. And then there are other ones that were classified as secret, might even appear occasionally on the bottom of the fold, there's an expression on the paper, there's the top of the fold and the bottom of the fold. The bottom of the fold is second news. They would show up there. Then I started looking at the top of the fold, and I realized those were top secrets. I never got to print those at table. But there was stuff going back and forth to the embassies very cool. So what does that have to do with anything? Well, it's a science office, and there was a satellite Landsat, and they were trying to work out whether Landsat could actually help with work. Uh, it was actually in Africa. There's a lot of aid, foreign aid projects in Africa. And things like um, deterrent fires, were, there were fires for crop clearing, how extensive those were, where was the agriculture. And so there was all this work going on. And so when I had time, I was working with this guy, geologist, who was trying to evaluate how Landsat was working. And I'd always liked maps. And I looked at this stuff and go, this is so cool. We can enhance this stuff. And I, I want to do this. So, Went to grad school. I was undergraduate in environmental sciences, and I should say, the University of Virginia. It's environmental science says it's plural, not environmental science, because we did meteorology, geology, hydrology, and ecology. I had to know all of those. And anyway, I went out of that, decided I want to do coastal oceanography. Made a detour in some wetlands. Had a great time tromping around, and and hip boots love 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 tidal wetlands. Um, I did some remote sensing that little side thing, flew in a small plane, hanging out the side, taking pictures with two cameras, one with regular film, one with infrared film, of my wetland in order to map it. And then I went on to satellite work doing, um, just chlor trying to measure chlorophyll in Delaware Bay and Chesapeake Bay. But if I had not done that project, if I had not known how to type, I have no idea where I would have ended out for the get here. So, end out, I got a job at NOAA, went to USGS in Florida, um, kind of a side thing. And so, well, the reason I'm on Lake Erie, I'll ca capture that. Why am I doing that? Um, I'm a you know, coastal oceanographer. <clears throat> I was working on Chesapeake Bay, some algal bloom, a satellite. I actually came up with a way to find the algal blooms of satellite at a time when there was no ocean color satellite available. I took a satellite that was designed for land and got it to find algal blooms. I was asked to give a talk down at a water institute in North Carolina in uh, uh, early November of some year. I won't mention what year, too many years ago. And uh, they said, we're having some problem with some algal bloom, some red tide thing over at the coast. And maybe this would be useful for them. So I got a name of someone. I didn't know. It happened to be a NOAA fisheries lab down there, Pat Tester, Dr. Pat, Pat Tester. And so I go back up to D.C., I call her up, and as she accounted later, 
I call, I call up and say, hi, I'm Rick Stump. I'm with NOAA up in D.C., and I might be able to do something helpful for you. And her response later, she heard this, wait, someone from D.C. is actually offering to do something useful? <laughs> <laughs> and so I started in on red tide, and this is Florida red tide. It ended up in North Carolina, terrible bloom. And then I moved to Florida and kept this up, working down there on the red tide. Well, Pat Hester was a close colleague with Gary Steel, who was at Glarel. Noah's Great Lakes Lab in Ann Arbor. And he, was, he wanted to figure out how to actually do something on monitoring and forecasting these blooms in Lake Erie. And he was sure that satellites might be useful. And Pat said, I know someone who could do this. So she got me in touch with Gary. We got me started. It was over 10 years ago. I'd actually done one little paper on a bloom earlier, so I'd had some experience. So because I worked on Florida red tide and North Carolina, I'm working on Lake Erie. So that's my detour. I didn't go camping out in the, uh, I went camping out west, but only for a few days somewhere in there. But, you know, a little different detour. That's, so that's how I got here. So Lake Erie, um, there's going to be a bloom this summer. That's what the poster says. <laughs> so that summarizes the talks, and it's not going to be a particularly bright uh, good bloom. There's going to be a bunch of scum. Anyway, so that was the other two talks today. Uh, hopefully it won't look quite that bad here. And that was 2015, which was the worst bloom ad ever. But anyway, Lake Erie, been doing all the work on satellites. So is it useful anywhere else in the country besides Lake Erie? And that's what I'd like to talk about here. So, um, and that this particularly we're going to talk about satellites. So I'm going to look at Lake Erie and anywhere else from 700 miles, 700 miles. Whoops, that should be 700 kilometers. Sorry, I got my units wrong here. 500, uh, 500 miles. Uh, yeah, that's Lake Erie. That's pretty much the right day, that particular image of when it looked like this in Putin Bay at that time in July. And that, by the way, the mommy still was in high flow, very high flow in July. But these blooms, they're a national problem. This is certainly an older one, but it, um, it makes the point that uh, they have toxin poisonings and health advisories in states all over the country. And the ones that are great um, that didn't realize they had a problem or didn't want to admit it, uh, one or the other. And, but it's all, all over. And uh, odd thing, that's, yes, the sea otters in California, Monterey Bay. The toxin comes out of the river, right out of some of the rivers in Monterey Bay, and right there, there are oysters that are filter feeders. They pick up the toxin, the sea otters eat it, and they die of cyanotoxin poison. So you even have odd things in salt water where freshwater blooms to cause a problem. Um, dog, uh, there are dog deaths all over Maryland for. Um, um, I think last year we didn't lose any dogs in Maryland, but for like the last five years, there are several dogs every year who die. And the reason is, for one thing, they're small. Their mouths are right at the surface where the worst is, and they don't know enough to swallow water, uh, not to swallow water. And it's the toxin. It has nothing to do with bacteria. Anyone who has a dog knows they seem to eat just about anything, and, but this is, this is a poison. And uh, microcystin is, is actually quite a potent poison. So keep your dog's cattle. There are problems with cattle also. And from what I understand, cattle will drink just about anything also, and they don't know the difference. Uh, the other problems, this was actually from uh, last summer. And Lake Okeechobee had a, there was a huge problem. Lake Okeechobee in southern Florida is Fascinating issue. It's the enormous lake, and it's completely surrounded by a dam. A little unusual. It's probably the only lake in the country that has a dam. It's about 30 or 40 miles across, and the dam goes the whole way around the lake. And the, the lake is actually above the surrounding land area. And last year, El Nino, you know, climate change, I'll know El Nino. Well, when there's an El Nino, it rains in the southern U.S. And Florida has a dry season and a rainy season. The dry season is the winter, and that's when it rains during the El Nino. So normally, Lake Okeechobee is low 
coming into the rain season, so they're fine. But any dam anywhere in the country, they have to lower the water level before you hit the rainy season. And in this case, they were lowering the water level when a massive bloom appeared, a sign of bloom appeared in Lake Okeechobee. They just run it in these canals down to the local bays. And in the St. Lucie, they had this, and it was just disgusting. Um, unbelievable how bad it was, the um, uh, overall. Enough that there was, um, there was briefings in D.C., con congressmen, people came up. What are they going to do about it? People were leaving their homes because they couldn't breathe the air, even inside. This is just fumes that were coming off of this, and it's microcystis. We don't have a good explanation as to why, but it was just they, they couldn't stand the air. Just, uh, just a disaster. So there's a problem all over. So in order to do any of this, we need to detect it. The question is how. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we actually detect these blooms in Lake Erie. Um, you might get a tiny bit of optics. You might even have to remember a little physics from high school or college. Everyone takes physics at any time. Oh, good. That's good. Uh, Roy G. Bill. You all do Roy G. Bill? <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so we're going to have a wavelength that matches Roy G. Bill. So anyway, you have to find the cyanobacteria, not everything else. And if you look around, okay, on the true color here, uh, what I have here, this is, it actually looks kind of grayish, it's sediment. Here it's a little study, subtle, but there's sediment coming out of uh, Lake St. Clair, coming down the Detroit River. And then, of course, you can see the greenish. Well, that works pretty well, but you get down to this stuff, and what is that? Is that sediment? Is that cyanobacteria? And how do you actually know what this is? So and if you talk about is it bright, it doesn't work. Well, and green is also a problem because, well, it's green. Okay, that might be it, and then how much there is. Well, just as another side with these, microcystis floats up to the surface, forms scums. Pretty, it's a very good process. Most of you probably have this. Everyone's been trained in microcystis here, right? Darren, uh, Doug, so they all know how it works. Floats up and down. Do, do you all know how that works, by the way? Okay, good. And I don't want to patronize you if you're experts on it. Okay. Well, Plankothrex actually doesn't do that. It stays mixed with the water column. So if you go on Sandusky Bay, it always looks just this nice, pleasant green with no scum. And um, because it doesn't, it just floats through the water column. And so you end up with that. So the question is, you can't just detect scum. Well, what we'd want to do with satellite is can we actually pick this up and not find everything else? Okay, so from your physics point of view, um, this is actually the reflectance of the water. We actually measured this from a, a radiometer we hold by hand. Um, it looks like a radar gun. Um, that's actually cool. Our original, the original model the company made for us, they took a, a flashlight, a cop's flashlight handle for the handle of this, and so the switch was an on and off. Yes. And so if you held it on the side of the road, it looks like people slow down. <laughs> but we pointed at the water, and it measures the wavelength of light from the ultraviolet out to the infrared. And we, what we do is measure the reflectance. So of all the light coming down, how much comes back out? And this is a cyanobacteria bloom, microcystis. Um, and microcystis is green. And just to capture, 400 to 500. Uh, Roy G. Bibb is kind of backwards. The physicists work the opposite way. I don't understand that. So it's blue is 400 to 500 nanometers, green is 5 to 6, red is 6 to 700, and near for red is 700 and beyond. Um, can I do a complete tangent here? Absolutely. Okay. Infrared light. Oh, people know about thermal infrared. But this is reflected infrared. It's different. Very cool how it was discovered, and I can't remember the, the scientist's name. This was about in 1800. He, he, he determined, figured out, okay, sunlight warms stuff up, heats it up, right? So he wanted to figure out how much sunlight warms things up. Or did it warm up differently in different wavelengths? Did blue light warm up differently than red light? So you put a prism out, and you separate the light. And I wish I could remember the guy's name. I'll remember tonight. And uh, so he put a thermometer in the blue, a thermometer in the red, and you all know from all your practice here, proper scientific method, you always have a control, right? So he put another thermometer just past the red. 
and he put them on the light, and he noticed he recorded the temperature over time, and he noticed his control was also going up. So that's odd. So he did it again, and it, the control went up. So he actually put one somewhere else in the room to make sure the temperature in the room wasn't changing, and that one didn't change. And he goes, huh, this is light beyond red, Latin, infrared. So it was discovered, because he was trying to do a proper controlled experiment, he discovered light that no one actually knew existed. So your fun trivia geek fact for today. <laughs> All right, they're green. Down here, the reason it's green is because the blue light's absorbed and the red light's absorbed. Blue light's absorbed by all kinds of stuff, chlorophyll, but also tannins, um, humic acid, tea. Everyone drink tea? That's humic acid, tannin. It absorbs that. Um, there's a load of these kinds of compounds. That's what make compost tea. You get natural tea. Iron, um, we, we're in Maryland. We have this brilliantly orange gray clay, iron oxide, absorb that. So that's all kinds of stuff that absorb blue light. That's the real problem to detect things. This, though, is really interesting. This little wiggle here is caused by phycocyanin. There's only two types of phytoplankton that have phycocyanin. Cyanobacteria, notice phycocyanin and cyanobacteria, it absorbs red light, and it's a brilliant blue, beautiful blue color. And then there's some red algae also that um, have, have it. And then chlorophyll A, and chlorophyll has an incredibly strong absorption right here. So the reason you have this odd little peak here is not that there's something special about it in the sense of scattering light, but because all of this is absorbed by phycocyanin chlorophyll. This drop here is caused by water. Water absorbs infrared light very strongly. It's actually one of the main reasons water heats up so well in the sun. It's because it's absorbing it, infrared light so strongly. So many methods look for chlorophyll in this way if you're out in the open ocean in blue water but it won't work in coastal water because you have all this other stuff. So, but these particular bands happen to be off a MERIS sensor. Uh, uh, MERIS is a medium resolution imaging spectrometer. European satellite launched on MBSAT-1, 2002. They decided it would be a good idea to have one that might be useful in coastal and inland waters. The Baltic Sea has massive cyanobacteria blooms, spectacular ones. This is a thousand square miles, huge blooms, bigger than Lake Erie, enormous ones. It'd be useful to actually monitor this stuff, so figure why don't we put a band that might pick up phycocyanin? Might be useful. Pick up chlorophyll, and the two are so close because there's a chlorophyll of fluorescence band here as well. So we put those to use, and potentially we can capture them. So what we do is actually do something here. How many people took calculus? doing oh, pretty good. There's a few people who did. Okay. Well, you calculus people, ever heard of the second derivative? Do you know it's actually useful? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The second derivative is a curve. First derivative, you know what that is? It's a slope. Second derivative is a curve. And a curve, if you look here, these are curves. So we're actually going to do a second derivative. There's a numerical second derivative. It's actually pretty simple. It's, you draw a line from there to there, measure the height of that, and believe it or not, numerically you've just done a second derivative. Keep that in mind. If any, you want to impress, you want to impress your friends, I have no doubt you'll impress your friends by telling them you know how to do a second derivative. Draw a line from there to there, and the height above it. That's your second derivative. Um, so we measure the curvature, which tells us in this case we're picking up. How big, of, how big this difference is, which tells us about phycocyanin in this one, which is great for chlorophyll. Now, a little fun thing about this one is it's a, was put in for fluorescence. I don't know if you all, did you all learn this one, that phycocyanin in chlorophyll, it's, okay, it doesn't fluoresce. Fluorescence is a way for uh, diatoms and greens, most algae, and most plants to get rid of excess photons. So they are in a position where they're getting in more than they can take, and they gotta get rid of it. So they fluoresce it out. Well, in uh, these uh, cyanobacteria, bacteria, they're not eukaryotes. 
So they have, there's two photo systems. Did you all learn that one? I see a bunch of dining heads. Excellent. Well, they're in the photo system that it doesn't fluoresce. This happens to be the peak for absorption of chlorophyll. So if it doesn't fluoresce, it absorbs. So this band was actually put in to measure fluorescence of diatoms and greens, but it's wonderful for measuring the absorption by cyanobacteria. So this dip doesn't exist for diatoms, for greens. It only exists for cyanobacteria. So we end up with a wonderful little peak. I won't get that one yet. So we can measure the amount of chlorophyll absorption for, if for anything that isn't fluorescing. So we have two tools here to actually pick this up courtesy of the Europeans looking for cyanobacteria and thinking they're measuring fluorescence, and we discover we can measure absorption. Just one other side of this, it gets very interesting when you get scum. And scum, it ends out plants reflect the infrared light spectacularly well, like is almost as well as white sand, even snow, huge reflectance in the infrared. This is everything. All these cells, whether it's back cyanobacteria, trees, corn, it just reflects it. So it gets really cool when you have scum because you have this enormously moving infrared. If we could see infrared light, we would be almost blinded by these blooms when they form scum. You would have to wear like sunglasses kind of thing. They're that bright overall. Uh, but you still see your nice little green peak and you see this very strong cyanobacteria, phycocyanin peak and the chlorophyll peak. I mean dip around there. So what we do, we pick up these two, and that, those are indices. Develop this on Lake Erie, and we put it to use there and go elsewhere. Just to cover a little more, little side thing with the, with the strong re infrared reflectance. I like this one because this was um, one of the very first papers, perhaps the first paper that actually did remote sensing of a algal bloom, and it was cyanobacteria scum. And they were using, mind you, this is 1974. They used color infrared film to do this. So that, this was commonly used in forestry because the infrared is so good at picking up plants. The emerald ash, somebody's doing emerald ash borers or the ash trees. There we go. When trees are sick, if what they would use is infrared, they would be bright red. And what they do is the infrared is red on the color film and then the others aren't, and so they would start turning paler and paler as they're sick or diseased or stressed. So anyway, somehow, Bob Wrigley, who was with NASA at his Ames Research Center, he got together with Alex Horn, who's a phytoplankton ecologist. He said, why don't we fly this over and see what we can see? And Clear Lake, God help us, Clear Lake <laughs> is full of cyanobacteria scum. <laughs> Go figure. And as they said, we saw a beautiful bloom, and unfortunately, the paper at the time is printed in grainy black and white, and it's just not, it doesn't look good. I tried to work, work this out, and I, but I'm still working on I'm trying to hunt down the original. I understand um, it's buried somewhere in a large, the original photographs are buried somewhere in a large warehouse in Kansas City. Anyone seen Indiana Jones? <laughs> no. That's so far I have not had luck finding that. I'm still I'm still lucky. I've made inquiry. It might actually be in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, USPS. I'm looking. Um, if we use the near infrared, okay, this is true color. Just to show you what it can do, this is the same image. This is the infrared band versus the true color. This is all scum. You can see how well you can see the stuff with it and how bright it is. You can't actually tell where the trees end and the scum starts. That's how bright it is. And that, uh, I did the math, yes, and this is 300 square kilometers of scum. This was in uh, 2015. And that was a really disgusting blow. Uh, but yes, and it also pierces, it is okay on piercing clouds. So it does work. We use our index, and dark red is the highest red. Warm colors are, are high concentrations, and now you can see, okay, yes, these bright green areas show up, but you see interesting stuff like this looks about the same color as the Detroit River plume, but that's cyanobacteria. We have chlorophyll A, and we have phycocyanin, whereas up here we don't have any of those. So we actually can pull that apart. That's the, that's the huge power of doing this, and we can quantify it as well. This is a capture in Lake Erie again. 
2011, 2015, and even these spectacular features here. These, these now are quantified. These are units. Um, you see 0 0.001, if you can look closely, 0 0.01. Those are in units of, at this point, there are just a radian. I won't try to explain that, um, but you've heard of a radian. The star rating is on a sphere, and I, we, we're not going to go into that one. Just take my word for it. And point, but point zero zero one star radians is the same as a hundred thousand cells microcystis per mil. We've worked up that relationship. Okay. Oh, sorry, I borrowed this from EPA. And they, they're trying. They have fun with this. Okay. We came up in Lake Erie that point zero zero one is a hundred thousand cells per mil microcystis. The people at EPA said, okay, will this work anywhere else? So they took our Lake Erie one and ran, uh, let's see, a whole bunch of lakes in Florida from the National Lakes Assessment, New England, and this, this is Grand Lake St. Mary's. This is Lake Champlain, which has some really wicked blooms. And they took that one and just said, okay, let's take, I processed all this Maris data for all those areas. They got all of these water samples, and this is the one-to-one -one line. Lake Erie relationship works in all these places. 0.001 is 100,000 cells. This is cool. It works elsewhere. This is not just Lake Erie. It works elsewhere. Just to go a step further, we took it and said, okay, how does this work for chlorophyll? Because essentially we're measuring chlorophyll absorption, what we're doing in cells. So this is actually from radiometry from some Florida lakes, which have blooms. And we came up with, a, you can see, a nice linear relationship. This is the chlorophyll. So we now have the amount of, this is chlorophyll from cyanobacteria, not from anything else, and from Florida. So now we can apply that overall. So we, we know this works overall. And just to, to kind of caption this fun side, we went through now. What can we do with this? So we're using the same CI product, that's what we call it, to measure chlorophyll biomass used for cyanobacteria. So here's a whole bunch of lakes in Florida, Lake Apopka which uh, is, I don't think it ever has a low it's, concentration. It's year-round. It's all the time. It's, it's, in fact, uh, someone had fun, Blake Schaefer, who's working with me on our project, he's at EPA, he gave a talk in Florida, and he was talking about Lake Apaca, and one of the people from Florida goes, no, they don't have any problem in Lake Apaca. And Blake actually didn't know it. He was taking my word for it. He was suddenly yeah. panic-stricken. Like I was, they were just, the Florida people were just hysterical because it's like they don't even bother monitoring Lake Apaca anymore because it's just constant. But here, what we did is simply took that relationship we got from a field measurement. You know my radiometer, the radar gun? That's how we got that relationship. We turned it around to the satellite straight on, and what we have here, this is field data for each of these lakes, and this is the satellite data. You can see Lake Monroe. 20 microgram, and they're scaled exactly the same. Everything's scaled exactly the same. So you can't read the numbers, but they're all scaled the same. Lake Dora, high, down, up, high, down, up. Lake Harris, a little higher, and Lake Dora, Apopka, of course, up there. We're getting all those relationships all spot on. It works consistently across this whole area. So we started with Lake Erie, and we're now mapping time series in Florida. Oh, I just forgot. Yeah, I did actually take a glance at Klamath Lake. I was asking about that. So, Clear Lake, Klamath Lake, uh, Klamath River. Oh, boy. Uh, Klamath River has such problems. Um, although you can buy a phantasomenon in health food stores out of uh, Klamath Lake if you want to. Seriously, it is, it is packaged and sold and guaranteed to be free of toxins. But mind you, there's no FDA regulation of health food stores. <laughs> uh, but it's all the way down the Klamath River, and then Clear Lake has frequent problems with mass. They get all kinds of interesting stuff besides microsystems. Oh, by the way, if, uh, if any of you saw the webinar, yes, do not consume fish livers. That was shown in Ohio, too. Uh, here's one. Here's Klamath Lake. I did forget we had that. Uh, that's what Klamath Lake looks like. Looks like Lake Erie, but and then we get down. If the river follows down here in Copico Lake and Iron Gate, and these, these are just off the charts. When it's this one, we're up at probably 200 micrograms per liter chlorophyll. When we're in the purple, it's just completely off the charts. And you, the color, you just kind of squint at this. Even if we turn off the lights, you just kind of go, well, maybe. 
uh, Iron Gate and Costco Lake, we're actually pushing the limits of the satellite resolution. These are 300 meter pixels. But when we put it together, um, are we picking up the blooms? These triangles here are when blooms were present. And this is what we're picking up for the chlorophyll concentration. These are field measure chlorophyll. And by the way, this chlorophyll number came from Florida. So we took this algorithm from Lake Erie. We, we applied it with Florida, came up with a relationship. We have a microcystis bloom, and we're saying we've got about 40 to 50 micrograms of chlorophyll, and that's what they measure. We're around 20 to 30. That's what was measured. So Lake Erie is put to use. No tuning at all. The same satellite algorithm, the same approach overall. That's what Lake Erie has to offer. Uh, Clear Lake, this is from a satellite, uh, and these are just some different, we're, we're making sure we're not picking up, uh, we're telling the difference between non fluorescing algae and then cyanobacteria, but the bloom here started um, dramatically June 16th, and chlorophyll concentrations went from 3 to 50 to 60 to 130 micrograms per liter in mid-July. There was only a couple of field samples, so we actually could pin down. It's clearly started. Um, between the 17th and increased dramatically in the 17th, and that's about 130 or so micrograms per liter chlorophyll. So we're able to pick up the development of this. And here you can see that it starts in the in this lower arm and then gradually moves up into the rest of the lake very dramatically. So we can think. Uh, that's uh, uh, in this case that was our processing for um, zeros weren't quite right an earlier version of how we handled the data. Uh, Potomac River, um, DC is up just off the top um, just off the top of these. So this is the river just below the Potomac, I mean just below Washington. And it occasionally gets a bloom. Um, this is what it looks like. This is microcystis again and if you if you can kind of see the sawdust type look on this. Uh, and so uh, a bloom started in Gunston Cove, which is right here. Um, George Mason reported that out on, here on July 27th, and we're able to get the extent as it meant, went down the river overall. And uh, it was possible for the state of Maryland to actually respond to this and go out and sample strategically. So they knew exactly, if they got a sample, they knew exactly where it was pertaining to the rest of it. So the state of Maryland was actually out and got, one, got uh, two samples in this to confirm it. And they have actually closed um, uh, some of the swimming beaches in Maryland due to microcystis. So we're actually able to get the extent of the bloom in this area. And we're talking about, this is about 20, 20 30 miles of, of river, tidal river overall. The Lake Okeechobee one I mentioned before, um, this is actually, we transferred it to MODIS, so this is kind of blocky. But you can see uh, this is using the infrared. This is all the scum all over Lake Okeechobee. And um, you can see it here. Uh, by the way, this is a rather cool, um, fascinating thing. I'll do another digression here. This is a summer image, June. And you notice about the only thing that's clear is Lake Okeechobee. All the water is clear. And it's uh, uh, sea breeze. Uh, you know how these clouds form in the summer, you know, the air warms up and then the water, the air goes up and then it condenses? Well, Lake Okeechobee is relatively cool, so the air is coming down and heading towards land, so you don't get any clouds forming. So everywhere else you have a problem, but there um, it's, it's clear. So we have this wonderful advantage that we can actually see the lake, even though most of the air is cloudy. But you can actually see some of the other estuaries and such. Anyway, this is extensive scum on June 14th. The outlets, there's one that goes from Okeechobee to the Caloosahatchee River. That is one used every year continuously. They only use the St. Lucie one going this direction when they desperately need to lower the water level. This is the El Nino winter. They desperately needed to lower the water level. It was um, the dike, the Hoover Dike is about 20 feet high and the water level was pushing about, I don't remember, it was getting close to 15 feet, and they had to get it reduced. The Hoover Dyke was put in. There was a hurricane that came through in 1926, uh, and there was a small dike around Okeechobee. 
it was a Category 4 hurricane, went straight through Miami, blew the water out over the dike, drowned 3,000 people. It's actually the uh, one of the three worst disasters, Galveston in 1906, Katrina, of a hurricane. 3,000 people drowned in here, not from ocean, but from the lake. So this is 1926, Herbert Hoover, who was president, um, he happened to be an engineer, a geologic engineer, and so they figured this out and they put up a much bigger one so this would never happen again. So they lower the water level, and the outtake is right here, and there's where the bloom is. So what happened, all that cyanobacteria was going happily down there. Uh, at that time, we were just about ready to set up supply data to the South Florida Water Management District, who supports the Army Corps of Engineers, but we hadn't gotten it to them. They had no idea that they were pumping all the cyanobacteria down the St. Lucie Canal. And so they ended out with just a disaster there. So uh, I have one other one here. I'm going to finish up with this one because this is, this is something that's actually quite fresh. Uh, Utah Lake, Utah. Um, I'd actually never heard of Utah Lake, Utah until last, uh, very recently. And I little did I know that it was the fourth largest freshwater lake in the western U.S., 36th largest in the U.S., uh, fun fact, 150 square miles, which is quite big. And who would guess in a desert? They had a bloom last summer. And 100 people sick? You don't hear that in Lake Erie, 100 people sick. <clears throat> this is off of the DEQ website. It's closed. You don't hear that here either. That's what the lake looked like. Okay, there's a problem. Um, conversations, we have a project to try to apply the satellite data across the country systematically. EPA is involved. So EPA Region 8, which includes Utah, contacted my colleague, Blake Schaefer, the guy who got surprised by Lake Kapapka, said, can you help us? Talk to us. I would actually met one of the guys from Utah, uh, from DEQ, said, can you run satellite imagery for Utah Lake for this summer? They don't want to be surprised about this again. This is not an annual event. This had not happened like this before at all. Little blooms, not the whole lake looking like that. So they are very concerned about this happening again. So we go, okay. We start processing data. We see this on June 18th. By the way, to put a context, that's Great Salt Lake. Um, this is the southern part of Great Salt Lake, and there's um, this is um, Utah Lake right here. Yes, it is. It's got a lot of sediment in it, kind of, uh, I'm not sure what, but it just kind of makes a milky color. Makes it a little interesting from a satellite point of view. So we would started just in early June, and on June 18th, we picked up, this is called Provo Bay, which would be a big sign of bacteria bloom. We let them know, and uh, they then went out and got samples in Provo Bay and found delictus chroma, two and a half million cells per milliliter. Right, this is big in the bay. And if I was going to estimate this, I would have said microcystis equivalents, we're at about two and a half million cells microcystis equivalent. For me, this is cool because we might be able to calibrate for delictus firma, because all we had was a microcystis one. So they, they sampled, they now knew they had a bloom. They did not know before we sent an image that they should sample there. Now this is, mind you, this is this year. That was June 18th. We've been sending imagery to them since then. June 30th, algal bloom spreading north. Oh, and by the way, samples collected at Lake show indications after bloom was spotted on satellite imagery. I'm not just making this up. This was reported in the press as, as it came from them. This is how, this is where we're going with this. That's July 7th, last week. And the whole lake, we're up at um, probably running well over 100,000, and we're pushing a million up here over the whole lake. That's where it stands right now. And they are, um, that's the press. Or this is July 12th, that's June 30th. It goes on. So this is the information they're actually getting from us in order to decide where they're going to sample and what the bloom's doing. And there's a huge irrigation. The Jordan River right here is 
extensively used for irrigation on crops. They have a big question about what they should do about that because they, a lot of people pump water out of the Jordan River for agriculture and what they're going to do, huge concern about that. So right now, this, this is live. We're now, we're now providing this data in order to try to help them guide this. So what is Lake Erie doing? Gave them enough warning that they, they started off here and we're tracking it rather than starting here with where the bloom's growing in order that they can keep 100 people from getting sick again this year. This just shows it from a true color size and just to make the point, because the lake's got this milky sediment in here, very hard, you can see that there's a coloration difference, but you can't see that pattern, whereas here it's unambiguous is where that is. So that's kind of, that's the value on this, I'm trying to pull that together. So yeah, Lake Erie is a great lake, and it's also been great for helping us with a whole lot of other lakes in the country. And we're in the process now of taking this. Uh, we have a project called Cyan, the Cyanobacteria Assessment Network, that we're going to be running data. We're taking the methods we developed in Lake Erie. We tested in California and in Florida. We're transferring to NASA, who has have serious processing capabilities. They've got several hundred servers. They, they run, it's kind of rather entertaining. Uh, but anyway, they're gonna be processing the whole country for this data set. The fun thing on there is that they have the servers set up is once, the, once it's set up, which is a little bit of a process, they can say start the run and go get a cup of coffee and when they come back, the a year's worth of global data has just been run. It's that kind of thing. Very entertaining on how that works. But that's kind of where we go with Lake Erie. I think that, yeah. So that's where Lake Erie helps with the rest of the country. Uh, as far as I know, it's mostly recreation. Um, I'm trying to pin down a little more on those those things. Rick, is it what's driving that moment in uh, Utah today? They don't have a good answer because this is not an annual. This is not. It would be easy if it had been happening like this for years, but it's there. I'm sure there's an ag link, but it's, that's not enough to explain what. So when you showed it was two consecutive. Yeah, it's two consecutive years, but it's not like 15, 14, 13, 12, 11. It's like 16, suddenly they had a horrible blow. That's the problem, and it's not like it rained there a whole lot. Yeah, but they, have, they had a record so far off the record. This year? Yeah, so it's not to one of last year. Yeah, maybe there's some factor in that that might explain it. There, there's a whole bunch of questions that can't, yeah. If I had more time, I could probably put this out. Yeah. There's a great time. Anyway, question over here. Oh, they, 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 certain, okay. Yeah, but if you like that way, like the detecting point, then that's it. Uh, well, there, there are some interesting methods with that with um, uh, lasers where there's um, what's called active sensing. We're using what's called passive, which means we just look at whatever light comes back off that's from the yeah. sun. There are active ways with laser where you actually target, like phycocyanin fluoresces at about 650, chlorophyll and chlorophyll A will fluoresce, of course, and so you can actually fire a laser at 620 or so, excite the phycocyanin and record the fluorescence signal back. So you could actually be very specific. The problem with that is uh, we can't quite pull that off with satellite at this time. Um, there's actually, believe it or not, there actually is a, a laser system for satellite for doing um, ice mapping. You would never guess that you could pull off, um, 
you'd think it wouldn't be eye safe, but it's <laughs> from satellite, but you can actually do that. But it's, there, we're not there for that. It's been done for aircraft. So there are some active, interesting active systems for, for going after that. For the most efficient for satellite, we have to go with the passive system. So the key thing is having enough wavelengths in order to do this. Like Landsat, um, it's got a blue, a blue band, a green band, and a red band. That's it, on an infrared band. It has four bands. So you can tell the water's green or red or blue. That's all you can tell with a Landsat kind of sensor. With this, we have all these red bands. So we've got, or yellow and orange, if you want to get specific. So yeah, Roy, oh, we've got all those colors. <laughs> you know, red, yellow, orange, orange, yellow, red, right. So that's, that's the value there is we have enough bands there that we can actually pull these out. Uh, ultimately, there are sensors that have more bands we could get even more precise. And NASA's got one that they're planning called PACE, which is called hyperspectral. So it's going to measure like 100 wave all, it's going to measure the 100 different wavelengths of light from 400 through the infrared. So we could do some really interesting things with there. Pick up carotenoids and all sorts of fun stuff. Next question there. Is this just a U.S. problem with the algal blooms or is it worldwide? Have there been any other cases worldwide with algal blooms? Oh, yes. It and is very you worldwide. Use this technology around the world. Yes. In fact, the method we have has been used uh, in the Caspian Sea. Uh, and it's been used, uh, I know, some papers on, in uh, Hungary, um, Lake Balaton, which is I think one, of the, one of the biggest lakes in Western Europe, which has terrible cyanobacteria blooms. Uh, our core method for detecting cyanobacteria, I, there's some the methods being used in Africa. They're using a different way to measure biomass, but they're actually using the way we do for Lake Erie to, to identify it as being cyanobacteria. So, and yeah, there's blooms. You want places that are the most, you know, have the most spectacular ones are the big lakes in eastern China, where massive. This we're not talking ag. This is this is urban eutrophication, like Lake Erie was in the 70s, and they're just uh, unbelievably bad over there. Now there's there's cyanobacteria blooms all over. We actually ran uh, one of my colleagues, Shelley Tomlinson. She was at a meeting, because we do marine stuff, she was at a meeting on shellfish in Ireland, and we ran Ireland, and we pulled up a lake in Northern Ireland that was flagging as cyanobacteria with our method. Uh, it's the biggest lake in Ireland, one of the biggest in the British Isles. We made some few inquiries and found, yeah, that cyanobacteria, they have a bloom. So we're, we're, we've actually been hitting, yes, they're all over the place, and there's a problem everywhere. It, the problem is we don't have a good idea how bad it is. One of the issues we're going to go when we do this nationally is try to answer the question of how bad a problem do we have in this country? If you take every medium to large lake in the country, how many of those actually have this as cyanobacteria? The National Lakes Assessment, I think I might have mentioned, um, they determined of the, all the lakes they looked at, 30% of them had detectable microcystins. So, Okay, we've got that reference. Now let's go in and say of all the lakes we can detect, how many have cyanobacteria, and then do a cross match of those and see how this pulls together. So is this appearance of cyanobacteria kind of the recent occurrence, or are we just seeing more of it now because we've gotten better at it? I like all the testing. We don't know whether it's more common. Well, Lake Erie, it's more common now than it was. So there's a simple answer. Uh, there are places we simply don't know because, yeah, we're, we're finding it because we can detect it or we're looking for it, and, but we don't really know how much of a problem there was before. One of the great things with satellite data, at least as far as it goes back, you know, like the Maris goes back to 2002, so for that 10 years of Maris, it's almost a time machine. So we can look at all these lakes from 2002 and 2003 where you can't go back and get a water sample. So we can at least answer the question of how bad were all these lakes. Our, a work study we've done with California, we ran it all, and they're actually doing that analysis to determine how many of these lakes had a problem in 2002 and 2003 and 2010. So they can start coming up with that. But 
we're looking now, so we find it and we have methods to detect it, but we don't we don't have the reference. So we're at least partly getting there with the satellite data. Uh, That depends on how much toxin is produced. Uh, the, the World Health Organization rule of thumb is when you hit 100,000 cells per mil, then you're you're likely to have a risk. But the practical part is not all strains are toxic or toxic all the time. So you you start off with that as a threshold. And it'll, actually, a lot of states they use that as their reference. If if they're not doing microcystin directly, they'll start off with They'll post advisories if they pick up 100,000 cells per mil. So that's that's the starting point. Okay, and ultimately, you really need a toxin. The ELISA test, uh, uh, that's that's kind of the standard on this. But one of the issues on this is, okay, here in Ohio, uh, Florida, uh, environmental protection, they're in Columbus. Uh, okay, how long is the drive from Columbus to here? Uh, 15 minutes. All right, so <laughs> we got it, okay. So they have, and there's probably a few places in Ohio that are a little further away. Okay, so if you, Ohio is actually pretty good on, on sophistication, but if you just simply sit down and do the math here, possible water body, there may be an issue. All they know is somebody looked at it and goes, eh, it doesn't look so good. They just looked at it. Okay, so someone from Columbus has to now get in the car, drive two hours and 15 minutes, Go get that water sample, drive back two hours and 15 minutes, and what have they done that day? Drive. And then the ELISA test, if they're going to do an ELISA, takes, what, six hours? Or are they trained enough as a taxonomist to actually count cells? Now, all you are going to be experts on this, right? So you'll be able to do this. Um, so the issue there is it will make their life so much easier. Someone says, you know, the water doesn't look so good. And they could pull up the satellite image and go, yeah, it's just normal. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. And that would that would make a huge difference on how this works. Now we've actually hit the other. When we were testing the algorithm, it was Buckeye Lake. And we ran this through and said, I called up Heather Raymond, Ohio EPA, and said, Buckeye Lake, where there's a state park, I think there's a problem there. So she called up the local the state park, so she called up the local park manager. He went out and looked at it and goes, it looks like it normally does. <laughs> you know, kind of the usual khaki color. He said, could you get a sample anyway? Well, it came back and it was full of, um, it was still just bromopsis, just full of it. So it kind of goes, works on both ways. But the, a big part is trying to reduce that effort of somebody getting, spending five, six, seven hours in a car driving. And if you're in a state like California, well, I mean, it's, you know there are, there are more than a thousand lakes in California. I had no idea until we worked. I figured there'd be ten, <laughs> <laughs> and there are over a hundred. We can see about 120 lakes with Marin data in California. In California, it's, and mind you, there are lakes from Los Angeles, south of Los Angeles, up to Oregon. That's six, seven hundred miles. They can't possibly monitor these lakes. They don't have any idea which. They know the Klamath River is bad. They know Lake Elsinore is bad, but they don't have any idea. And that's that's half the battle of what do you even bother trying to go sample? How do you set up a strategy to do this if you don't know where you have a problem? So that's the big part of this. Was the Utah lake toxic? Was that a microcystis? Pardon? Was the Utah lake, was that a microcystis? Uh, until like the sperm? What's the, the toxin? I don't know if you know. I believe I'm that. I tell you, it's, um, it's late today. Um, yeah, yeah. A few, a few thoughts have started to talk. You can't tell from the satellite. <laughs> no, I can't tell you. I can't find toxin from satellite now. But I'll, I, I'll, I'll be checking. I'll, it'll come back, or I'll confirm it. Yeah. I forgot in between talks. Does professors have any pressing announcements? Doug, anything in your class? Well, not Saturday.